Hello, this is my fifth video on Gestalt psychology, in which I will continue my account of the Gestaltist approach to thinking and learning. I will also talk a little about the Gestaltist approach to memory and about the overall impact of Gestaltist ideas on psychology as a whole. After World War I, the Gestaltists continued their work on the nature of thinking and learning, the trio being joined by a growing number of younger researchers who had become interested in their ideas. One of these, Kurt Lewin, later described as the founder of modern social psychology, applied the Gestalt concept of closure to the everyday experience of a waiter presenting a bill to a customer. A waiter could easily remember the details of a customer's unpaid bill, but would promptly forget it after the bill had been paid. He theorized that the unpaid bill lacked closure and so generated tension and maintained memory. Bloomer Zygonik, one of Lewin's graduate students and subsequently a leading figure in Soviet psychology, tested this idea, giving volunteers a series of simple tasks but not allowing them to complete some of them. Asked about the tasks a few hours later, the volunteers remembered the uncompleted tasks about twice as well as the completed ones, a phenomenon later named after her as the Zygonik effect. Again, Kohler's animal experiments in Tenerife generated much further research. Thus, there was an obvious application of his work to human learning and several experiments were conducted on babies and children to confirm the relevance of Kula's observations. Thus, in one of these, toys were placed outside a playpen or on a shelf which could be retrieved with sticks or with a chair or a box. In this environment, children aged from one and a half to four years displayed similar behavior to Kula's chimps, but with more insight than the chimpanzees. Again, even babies aged 8 to 13 months showed evidence of insight learning, with some variation. Thus, two of them almost immediately saw that they could use a stick to reach for a toy at the far side of a table, whilst others played with the stick for a while before they saw its possible use after it had come near the toy. The youngest baby never solved the problem, however. There were also adult studies by Carl Duncker, who had also done the baby experiment. In one of these studies, Duncker presented adult subjects with a theoretical problem and asked them to solve it, whilst also describing their thinking out loud as they did so. Most subjects started with obvious techniques, which they then realized wouldn't work. They then tried to analyze the essential properties of the problem to arrive at a functional solution. Some did this from the beginning. A second approach was to present subjects with a practical problem. For example, the famous candle problem, in which the subjects are asked to attach a small candle to the wall using any of an array of possible tools which are available, such as tacks, paper clips, pieces of paper, string, pencils, and small cardboard boxes. The successful solution to the problem required some creativity by the subject and the selective use of the materials available. The small boxes were crucial. If they were empty, Everyone eventually realized that they could be tacked onto the wall to provide candle platforms. But if the boxes were full of matches or tacks, then less than half of the subjects solved the problem. For Duncker, many subjects were impeded in solving the problems he set them by what he called functional fixedness. This was the common characteristic of thinking in which the problem solver had a cognitive bias against using objects in unexpected ways and could only see an object as having a particular function and not see alternatives. To solve the problems, the subjects had to discard such expectations, realizing, for example, that a hammer could be used as a paperweight or an electromagnet could be used as part of a pendulum. Therefore, Morton Hunt suggests, experts are often those least able to see alternative solutions, and scientists often make their most original contributions early in life when they're less fixed in their thinking habits. Wertheimer also addressed the problem of thinking in his later work, noting historical examples of the way in which creative thinking among scientists and mathematicians followed a pattern of insights 
or often successive insights. Thus, Galileo and others had stated that many of their breakthroughs had come from a sudden understanding which had enabled them to gain a new view of a problem. Insights often came as a result of seeing and understanding a pattern, as with the mathematician Carl Gauss. When Gauss was six years old, his teacher had asked a class who could first give him the answer to adding up the numbers from one to ten. To the teacher's amazement, Gauss had the answer in seconds. Gauss had realized that the numbers could be paired, and that each of the five pairs, one and ten, two and nine, three and eight, four and seven, five and six, came to eleven. The answer was therefore five times eleven, or fifty-five. He had seen a structure that had instantly led to a solution. Again, after extensive discussions with Einstein, Wertheimer traced the growth of the theory of relativity as a series of successive breakthroughs, whereby Einstein gradually abandoned the assumptions of the prevailing Newtonian paradigm, each stage leading logically to the next. These studies had educational implications. Rote learning was based on an associationist view of thinking, but if educators wanted to encourage productive thinking by their students, they had to enable the students to see the whole problem. Rote learning impeded creativity. Gestalt theory was also applied to the study of memory. Here, Kafka gathered much evidence to show that memory was a weaving together of experiences by means of meaningful connections. It was not a mere aggregation, as in association theory. This may seem commonsensical, but at the time, associationist and behaviorist ideas dominated psychological thinking. Thus, in terms of the memory experiments of Ebbinghaus and others, it was much easier to remember a meaningful phrase or sentence than nonsense syllables. For example, it was easier to remember a thing of beauty as a joy forever than a meaningless phrase like pud sol dat rus mignom. Associationist theory was not able to explain why one was so much easier to learn than the other, but Gestalt theory's postulate of meaningfulness provided a ready explanation. Kafka also suggested that memories are based on physiological traces in the central nervous system, permanent neural changes induced by experience. This was much later supported by the work of neurophysiologists who began to discover the actual cellular and molecular changes involved. He also suggested that existing memory traces would interact with new memories, influencing how new experiences were perceived and remembered. This was again later borne out by observational data by people like Piaget. New memories were not simply added on. The Gestaltist work was multifaceted, but linking it together was an emphasis on the structuring of thinking, learning and memory in terms of patterns, or Gestalten, combined with the insistence that meaningfulness was a key element in understanding behavior. Let us now try to make an assessment of the overall impact of Gestaltist thinking on psychology. On the one hand, we can see that it has been both profound and multifaceted. But at the same time, these impacts are now largely forgotten, Gestaltist viewpoints now having been absorbed into the general corpus of psychological ideas. This is most obvious in the absorption of Gestalt perceptual principles and such concepts as insight learning and functional fixedness but there are many other elements of Gestaltist influence. Chief amongst these was the restoration of mind as a central concern of psychology. This was particularly true in the United States where, although it never completely replaced behaviorism, it revived and renovated the cognitive tradition, thus preparing the way for the so-called cognitive revolution of the 1960s. Thus, the Gestaltist restored meaning and thought to the study of learning and to psychology as a whole, radically expanding its scope and dimensions. In so doing, they brought with them the central Gestalt doctrines that the whole, the Gestalt, is different from the sum of its parts and dominates our perceptions 
and that acquiring knowledge often takes place through a process of structuring or centering. Again, the Gestaltist perspective significantly deepened the study of memory, emphasizing the importance of the web of meaning, a seemingly obvious observation, but displaced by the prevailing psychological paradigms of the day. In conclusion, let me briefly note the relationship between the Gestaltist perspective and those of mentalism and behaviorism. As to the first, we have to ask whether the Gestalt approach is a form of datism. Certainly, it is true that Gestalt theory holds that mind, by its very nature, imposes certain kinds of order on experience. But, at the same time, Gestalt theory does not hold that there are innate ideas. Rather, the mind is believed to possess the ability to perceive meaningful patterns and structures. This Gestaltist perspective has been supported by later research on language acquisition, including the observations that children sense the grammatical structure of sentences long before they are taught, and that deaf children who have not been taught to use sign language invent their own at between the ages of three and four with distinctions between agent, action, and object. As to behaviorism, the major Gestaltist idea that behavior is a pattern of reflexes aimed at achieving a particular goal stands in obvious contradiction to behaviorist views. For Gestaltists, behavior is not a chain of reflexive responses mechanically triggered by a stimulus. Thus, the young chick pecks at things that it knows to be edible the instinct is goal-oriented, driven by hunger. It is not a mechanical or an automatic response to the sight of food. The chick does not peck when it is sated. Again, the Gestaltist observed that much learning takes place through the processes of organization and reorganization in the mind in advance of any reward, and not through chains of associations created by rewards. This said, the Gestalt approach to learning and problem solving did not discredit the findings of the behaviorists, nor a Wundt for that matter. It limited them, but did not eliminate the behaviorist perspective. The reward-based trial and error model of behaviorism could remain valid for many simpler animals, but studies of humans and more intelligent animals were illuminated better by the Gestalt approach. Gestalt thinking permeates modern scientific psychology. It combines an emphasis on the importance of meaning and thought with a requirement for rigorous experimentalism. Its assumptions underlie such diverse approaches as the interest in neural network models in neurophysiology and information processing theory in cognitive psychology. Thank you for listening.